Uh, hello everyone, welcome to that seminar. So today's speaker is Salon Gombert. Uh, Salon comes from uh, Boston University where she is a professor. Uh, she has done her PhD at Princeton with Jennifer Axford and Vaz Balak. And uh, today she presents she present her recent work on the transition from BGP to secure BGP and the resources public key infrastructure. Uh, work that has been presented at SICOM and Hotnet. And, uh, um, so I just want to mention my co-authors, one of whom is Kyle Rogel over there, um, who did his undergrad at the university. Um, a lot of this work was done, the main student author is Robert Leitchev, who's a graduate student who's also been at the university for the last few years. Um, so what I want to talk about is as we try to secure routing, so probably we've worked on for 20 years, we're starting to make some headway, um, trying to talk about what is the right path to go through a, adoption of these protocols. So just to set the stage, and um, so we know what part of the network we're talking about, I just want to go over a little example of how <coughs> the domain routing works. So I picked a very particular example here. We have this server here that's um, a spam host server hosted at this IP address. This IP address is part of an IP prefix, and I know I'm at Stanford at the next so I probably don't need to do this, but <laughs> this is what an IP prefix is. So, an IP, so this is a slash 24 prefix, which means the first 24 bits are fixed, and the remaining eight bits are free, so that's 256 addresses in this prefix, one of which is the server. And now when people want to learn paths to the server, um, this autonomous system, each one of these networks here is a, a large autonomous system, um, will announce the route to the prefix. So here we have this autonomous system 2997 saying that if you want to reach this IP prefix, you can route to me, and of course this address is contained in this prefix, and so all addresses in this prefix will be accessible through here. Okay, so this is the basics of injury domain routing. We have um, traffic will, uh, announcements will propagate in this way. So every one of these autonomous systems, whenever they want to make a routing announcement, they select the path that they use, they, they um, mention the path that they're using, and then they put their own name. And so each node will learn a path through the network consisting of the names of the autonomous systems along this path, and I've just replaced the autonomous system numbers with their names here, but really these are numbers. <coughs> So I picked this spam house server for a particular reason. So people have probably heard in March there was this attack on spam house that was supposedly the largest denial of service attack that we've ever seen. Um, this was an actually really interesting event because there are a lot of different things that happened during this attack. One of the things that happened apart from the denial of service, completely different thing, was actually an UGP attack. And I want to show you the mechanics of this attack that happened in March. So what happened here is this is coming from a blog post by, these, uh, by this network, Greenhost. This is what they posted on their blog. So this was their normal path that they were using to get to this spam host server. And what happened was this network here became adversarial and wanted to host a competing server here and basically trick people into using this server instead of that one. So here's how they did it. They sent a routing announcement or an IP prefix, which exactly covers the address of this server. So some people might see this and find this funny. Um, this is kind of funny because this is a single IP address. This is a slash 32. It is funny, but this actually worked. And Spamhouse <laughs> actually did route this way. Okay, so why does this work? So was this an AS that had been, cyber so longer than an AS that had been around for a while? Um, or that you popped up? Yeah, so some of these popped up. So you notice that there's three ASs on this path. This yeah. one's no longer seen. Uh -huh. And this one is Bellsurf, and I don't know why it's here. Um, this one, I think, is also not seen anymore. Yeah. So It'd be that they popped up just for the purposes of doing this. Yeah. yeah. I think in particular, I don't know why. Or wasn't that they've taken over an HD? So Cyberbunker was providing services to various people. I'm not really sure how they managed this. I don't know if it was the owner of AS or something. Technically, the AS that was doing this. Um, so the, a couple of reasons why this is funny. This is a single address. But the important thing, the reason I'm showing this example, is the reason that Spam, uh, the Greenhouse chose this path is because this prefix is more specific than that prefix, and the way that routing works is you always pick your more specific prefix. So this kind of attack will always work if you are the attacker, have a more specific prefix than a legitimate destination. Actually, there is a legitimate use case for this, and that's, that is that if you wanted to move that host somewhere else in the network, you can route it, right? Nice. So this won't it's really, a good feature, right? Well, it's actually not supposed to work because <laughs> most networks are not supposed to accept anything shorter, longer than slash 24. 
So this was kind of funny that, that they got away with this slash 32. Um, but we've seen other events, for example, the Pakistan YouTube hijack, where this was a slash 22 and this was a slash 24. Right? And that cannot be prevented by the sort of standard route of people who don't, don't accept slash 32. So actually, when I saw this, I was kind of surprised. Um, and we know that this was malicious, because here we have this blog post that I'm showing you, and here's the attacker saying that we got your server. Well, are you saying there, there actually is a use case for, me, for letting that work, and that it allows you to move as it goes around? Right. Them. So it's, right. it's sort of a feature, although it's not designed for it. I don't think it's an error, but it's a potentially useful feature. So I just wanted to mention that this was an, an interesting recent event. Um, this is the Pakistan YouTube one that probably a lot of people have heard of. This one happened because they were using this technique. There was a use case. The use case was censorship. They wanted to block access to YouTube, so they hijacked the prefix of YouTube inside Pakistan. The traffic leaked outside of Pakistan and took down YouTube. Um, this was in 2010, where China, uh, China Telecom announced a lot of prefixes and um, hijacked some of them. This is a thing I found very recently, there are some Chinese um, IEEE journals that you can read where they talk about a system for censorship, and it's kind of hard to understand what they're doing, but I think maybe they might be doing prefix hijacks. So it's possible that this was somehow related to this, but I'm not sure. Um, and then there are other events here. Um, for example, Con Ed did roughly the same attack as this China Telecom attack in 2006. The only difference was in this one, sorry, this one, the network went down, and the China Telecom one was really interesting because the traffic flew in, uh, flowed into China Telecom and then left and continued on its merry way and nobody knew what was happening. So in a lot of these cases the network just goes down and some of them it, it gets interesting. Excuse me. Yeah. This China attack you're referring to is the one that the basically thirty percent of the traffic to China would be directed. Yeah. Or something and I didn't like say attack by the way. These are all there's, there's not an understanding of what the intent was in any of these cases. So if I said the word attack I did not mean to <laughs> <laughs> why isn't there any understanding of the intent? Um, so, for this particular one, I know that there were some forensics done on this one, and they were trying to understand it for subprefix hijacks. The subprefix hijacks would look much more suspicious than announcing the exact same prefixes, which would sometimes happen as a router bug, and they found that it was not subprefix hijacks. So, that's what we know. Um, Alright, so, we know how to solve these problems. We use cryptography, right? And um, it seems actually kind of simple how they might solve these problems. And there's a lot of solutions been proposed over the past few years, and I want to focus on the two that have been getting a lot of traction recently. The first one is called the ARC API. Um, this uh, was standardized a year ago, but deployment started even earlier than that. And what this thing does is it certifies IP address allocations. And so what that means is we can no longer have someone claiming to own a prefix that they don't actually own, because this is a sort of trusted database that will ensure that the prefix to AS mapping is trusted. So the important thing to keep in mind about this is that this is a sort of like a database that's checked out of band. It's not like the routers are every time they get a routing message, they're going to do a bunch of cryptography to figure out what this message is. There's a centralized, well, there's a distributed database. You download it to your local cache, you do the verifications, and then the routers check against this local cache. So it's really not um, a very crypto-intensive protocol for the routers. And then, but that requires everyone along the path, <coughs> if I'm seeing an advertised data spot. I didn't know whether someone was passing off something to trust them. No, that's this protocol. So when I show you the details of this protocol, this is this is just prefix data. So in this protocol, that's true. So this is the this is the protocol. So this there's been a lot of contention on how to properly design this. Um, about ten years ago, there was a lot of discussion about this. The protocol that they're currently standardizing is called BGPSec. It's the um, older brother of BGP, uh, Secure BGP. So what this is doing is it's certifying routing announcements. It's actually verifying that the entire BGP path is correct, and it's signing the messages with public key signatures. So this is a much more crypto-intensive protocol. You're changing the BGP format, and you're using six signatures on that. So if you're not completely sure how these work, I promise I'll share exactly what you're doing. Um, so, I mean, in terms of oh, and where we are today is we have about 1% deployment of our yeah, in terms of uh, certificates being issued. So, what are the challenges of deploying this? Um, we know how to design these protocols, and in fact, the first designs of these were made in, in 2000. Um, so the, the challenge of getting these deployed, and what I'm going to be talking about mostly, is if you want to deploy such a thing in the internet, you have to deal with the fact that not every network will adopt it at the same time. It has to be backwards compatibility, so if backwards compatible, so if you adopt this protocol, you shouldn't all of a sudden lose access to a large part of the internet that has no, not yet adopted the protocol, which is, by the way, one of the difficulties of IPv6, right? Because it's not very backwards compatible. 
And finally, what I'm not showing you here is that it should provide you with some security benefits. So if you're going to go to all this effort, it should be these two things plus give you some value. Um, so what we're trying to do in this, uh, in these works, this series of works, is try to understand how you uh, adopt these protocols and what they give you. And there are a couple of questions that we answered. Um, one of them was, what do you actually get in terms of security for these protocols? Seems like that question should be answered by the protocol itself, but what's really understood about these protocols um, is that we know that if you, for example, certify routing announcements with, with signatures, then you know that nobody can lie about the routing announcements. But what does that actually mean about resistance to attacks? So because the route, routing announcements are signed, does that mean that you actually won't choose routes to the attacker? And how does this interact with the fact that this is happening on a graph where there are different networks making different decisions and using these protocols in different ways and affecting each other? <coughs> so that's really what we're looking at in this um, in these bunch of works. Another set of questions are, what do we actually, um, what are the incentives for networks to adopt these protocols? So when you retroactively secure a system, you want to give some sort of incentive to do this. And we have some works on this, and I'm not going to talk about today, about the economic incentives of using these protocols. And then finally, the thing that I'm most excited about right now is how they change trust relationships. So when you put crypto into a system, crypto is just a way of codifying trust relationships. And sometimes when you put crypto into a system, you change the trust relationships, and this can be uncomfortable for people. And this is particularly the case with certificate hierarchies, and so this is one of the things I want to talk about today, and that's the focus of our talk. Okay. So in specific, um, what are we looking at when we talk about what are the security benefits of these protocols? What we want to understand is, as we move from a deployment of the RPKI, which is this sort of offline protocol that doesn't actually change the routing messages, towards this full cryptographic deployment of BGPsec, what kind of value do we get as we move from here to here? And when I say move, I say I mean that as more and more networks deploy this protocol, how much more benefit do we get moving from BGPSec to RPKI? Um, and to spoil my to give a spoiler, the result is that getting having the RPKI deployed is actually the most important thing, at least from what we're finding. Um, and the gains that you're getting from BGPSec, you do get some gains, but they're marginal in many cases, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by this. Okay. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk about is given that the RPKI is so um, valuable in terms of providing security, how can you actually um, deploy the system in a way that doesn't make people uncomfortable in terms of trust relationships being altered and introducing new vulnerabilities into the system? And that's the subject of the, the hot network. Okay. So, um, so there are two parts to the talk. The first part is most of the talk, and the second part is three slides. So I'm going to start talking about this um, uh, security benefits of RPKI and BGP. Second, I have to start with a bunch of background telling you what these two protocols do. So first of all, what is the RPKI? So the RPKI is a cryptographic certificate hierarchy. And this is the way it works. What I'm showing you here is the IP prefix allocation hierarchy. So what we have over there is a, a regional internet registry. What it does is it allocates IP prefixes. And what I'm showing here is it allocating this prefix to this organization sprint and then another prefix to another organization and so on. So these are sub allocations and you can see that this prefix is a subset of that one. And so Okay, so what the RPKI does is it uh, certifies this, this hierarchy. So now you can think of each one of these entities as a certificate authority. They have a certificate. Inside the certificate is a key. The key can be used to sign a certificate for the person that it's delegating the address to, and so on. So that there's a key here that's signing this, and this key is signing this. And the validity of these certificates depends on the cert signatures being valid, and also the prefix being subsets of each other. So if you look at this, this is different from the SSL certificate hierarchy in an important way where you require that these names be subsets of each other. Right? In, the, in the SSL certificate hierarchy, any CA can issue any certificate for anyone. That's not the case here. This is a big difference. And I told you about, um, I told you that this certifies IP address allocations. And what I mean by that, what this says is that this prefix is allowed to be announced in BGP by this autonomous system. Okay, so, um, and so what happens is a certificate will issue these objects called ROA, which is route origin authentication, saying that this prefix is allowed to be signed by this AS, and this is again just this key in here signing a message that says this. Okay, so these are leaves of the hierarchy, and these are um, intermediate things. All right, so what can we do with this? So if we go back to our cyber bunker example, and we imagine that you were allowed to accept slash 32s for now, um, if we had this RTKI, we would have a ROA here saying that this prefix belongs to this autonomous system, and that would exist in the RPKI. And so if Greenhost was actually using the RPKI, what it would do 
because it would check the validity of these two messages. And you can see that um, this message here is RPKI valid. So this is a weak form of validity, right? It just says that the last hop and the prefix match. Okay, so that's what RPKI validity means. And this thing is RPKI invalid, and the reason is because there's no row out saying that this AS should announce this particular prefix. So what is our guy going to do? He's going to look at the validity and he's going to say, well, this one's invalid, and I'm going to use the valid route, and then we stop the fix like that. So um, if you look at this, probably many people think I can easily subvert the system, right? Right, OK. So how do you subvert the system? I was waiting for the question, but since I'm only going to be 45 minutes, I'm going to wait. I'll just show you. OK, so this is how you subvert the system. Right, so we have this weak notion of RPKI validity, which just depends on the last hop on the path. And so what you're going to do is you're just going to announce this route that's bogus, but it's RPKI valid because this AS and this prefix are in this row and everything's all good. Right, so what's our guy going to do? So now he has a decision. He has to decide between um, two paths that have equal length prefixes. So we no longer have the situation we had before where the attacker will always choose the bogus route because it has a longer prefix. Now they're equal length prefix, and so the decision is based on the path length. Right, because these are both slash 24s. So this path happens to be shorter, and so he'll write this one. Okay, so now it's the path length that's going to determine the success of the attack. Alright. So how do we defeat this attack? And so, by the way, if we go back into the history of these sort of uh, protocols, people were aware of this right away, and no one would have thought that RPP on its own would be, you know, the solution to the problem. What you need to do is you actually need to secure the path. Alright, so now let's see how this works. So what happens is that we use the certificates in, this, in the RPKI to issue uh, keys for each one of these autonomous systems. And now we have these keys that are stored by the RPKI, and they can be used to sign routing announcements. So this is a cryptographically signed routing announcement. What I'm showing here, this autonomous system is saying, this is the prefix that I'm using. And he's saying, SCNet, you can use this prefix, and that whole, uh, this path, and that whole thing is signed by his key. The next guy in the path will use that message, put his own path in, authorize the person he's <coughs> giving the path to um, to re-announce this path, and then he's going to sign that with his key, and so on. Okay, so this whole blob here is signed. And so you can build up a chain of signatures, and you know that everyone on this path is, um, has said what they uh, is, is actually using this path. So why does our attack fail? Right? This forward signing thing, the fact that you're telling the person, the fact that the name of the person you're giving the path to is actually signed is what protects the security of this protocol, right? Because if our attacker wanted to claim this path here, he needs to have a message from this guy saying he was authorized to announce this path. But of course he has no such message because he has no such edge. And so he cannot claim to have a path to the legitimate prefix and the attack fails. Okay, so that's So here's what, we, what we're doing in this paper. So that's the end of the background. What so we question. Did, yeah. So how often is this uh, RPKI database updated and like? Very cached? uncommonly. It's it's like months. It's not supposed to be very regular. So I mean, this this is just a set of authorization. You can think of it as a whitelist for who's allowed to announce which prefix. You would have pull a row out of the RPKI because you're doing something. Kind of so let's say I see a new announcement and it's not there in my database yet. What yeah. do I do? Okay, so I want to get to that later. Actually, are you talking about at, during the adoption path? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question, actually. So I'll, I'll get to that later. It makes things difficult, actually. Okay, so um, so here's the here's the setup for our um, for our analysis. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that the RPKI is fully deployed. What that means is that prefix hijacks and subprefix hijacks don't happen. We just have this attack or uh, this attack that. Uh, that I showed you before, which is the one hop hijack, where the attacker is doing this. Okay. So assume that that's the only attack that we have. What we want to understand is as we move from a world in which everybody has RPKI and no one has BGP sec, all the way to a world in which everybody has BGP sec, how does security improve? Okay. And the reason that we chose to ask this question was we tried to understand, given that BGP sec is a more intense protocol, what are you actually getting by, going, by making this transition? And the way we're going to answer this question is we're trying to understand how many networks will actually avoid being attacked. How many networks will avoid going right into the attacker. So there's a bunch of things that we did here, but I'm just going to show you a few of them. Um, okay. 
So in particular, we're interested in this question of partial deployment because we want to move from a world where no one's got PGPSEC to a world where everyone does. And in a world of partial deployment, we need back backwards compatibility, right? So if this network did not speak PGPSEC, that's why it's purple, Greenhost still needs to accept legacy routing announcements from it because otherwise it would lose access to the legacy speaking part of the network, right? You can't just turn off insecure announcements because you just lose access to a lot of things, particularly in partial deployment. So of course this guy can exploit that, right? He can exploit the fact that he can send insecure announcements. And the way he's going to do it, and this is really the threat model for most of this paper, is he's just going to, to do the same attack we saw before. Okay? And this attack will work, because this is a plain BGP announcement. This is RPKI valid over here, right? So we have RPKI. And uh, because this is just plain BGP, he can't verify, uh, Greenhost cannot verify that this is incorrect. So now basically from Greenhost's perspective, it learns two routes. It learns a secure route that's long and an insecure route that's short. Okay, so what should you do? Right. Secure. So this is really the crux of the whole paper. So if we're just thinking about security and we're just security people, we would say you should choose secure and then we're done. Okay. But um, if you actually think about how this thing would be deployed and you talk to operators, would they choose secure routes right away first as the most important thing? So uh, the answer is no, they wouldn't. Um, we did ask them. Oh yeah, I mean, you have to ask them. We right? did, we asked them. Oh great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, that's, that's, I mean, that's an interesting question. Like, what did they say? What did they say? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll show, you, I'll show you what they say. So first I need to do a little bit of more background and then tell you what they say. So, I mean, the important thing to keep in mind is imagine, you know, you're running a network and you have this expensive route that's secure and this cheap route that's insecure. What are you going to do, right? You actually do need to think about this. So to understand how this works, I just want to review um, how people make um, <coughs> routing decisions, this is a very simplified view of this. Okay? So in, in practice, this has about 12 or 8, eight steps, depending on what you look at. So the first step that we modeled was local <laughs> preference. What local preference is, is that an autonomous system can label any routes according to whatever criteria it wants. So for example, it can label a route as, this is a provider route, it's expensive, it charges me a lot of money. And you can label a route as, this is a customer route, I get paid for sending traffic on this route. So there's all sorts of economic considerations that determine how routes are labeled. That's that and various other things are boiled into local preference, also um, <coughs> from balancing. The second thing is after you after you go through this uh, lo local preference, then there's a preference for routes that are shorter, and shorter just means the number of ASs on the path. And then there's a number of other criteria that have to do with if you've heard of meds, they have to do with that. Um, you know how close they are to a particular network, hot potato routing, all these things. We didn't model this because all of our experiments will be done on graphs of the AS level topology, and so we don't have information that can inform doing anything with this, so we just grouped everything together. Okay, so this is how people make routing decisions. Now this is what, yes? So, performance is often divided into things like latency and bandwidth, right? So yeah, this is like me opening a huge can of worms. Yeah. It actually doesn't matter at all for this paper. So, okay. um, yeah, so there's a debate in the networking community about whether AS path actually determines performance, and a lot of people say it doesn't. Anyway, I, it doesn't matter for me. Okay. The point is that people do prefer shorter routes, and so that's, yeah. Um, okay, so this is what we would want as security people, and this is what a network operator might prefer because local preference could encode the cost of choosing a route. So he might prefer to use that, or, or she might prefer to use that as the first priority and then have security be the second priority. We call this um, our security second model. Another model would have them prefer shorter routes over um, secure routes. And uh, we actually, so as a result, we have three models for this. And so we went and asked <coughs> operators what they would do. We give them a list of the BGP decision process, and we ask them where would you put security. And these are the answers that we got. Um, so you'll notice we asked 100 operators about 100 answers. You'll notice that this doesn't add up to 100 because some of them said they didn't want to use BGP at all, or they said there's not standardized, they can't answer this question. So we got as much as we could out of them. And this is what we learned. Um, some would actually put security first, and um, most of them would put it third, and some of them would put it second. So we did a survey at them on their own. Okay, so what does our paper do? Um, what we're looking at is we're going to assume that everybody uses the same security model. And then if we want to understand what are the security benefits, which I have to explain what they are, but we're trying to quantify the security benefits of BGPSEC in a world where some set of ASs is secure. So assume that everybody uses the same um, security policy, either this one or the other one, or the other two. Um, and what happens if you deploy BGP in a set of SAS? So that's our main question. Um, I, I should note that um, the simulations and the theoretical results we proved were in a model of local, we use a particular model of local preference. 
the model we used, for, so for those who don't know what I'm talking about, it doesn't matter for everything, anything I'm going to show, for those who do, um, we use the Galrex rig model for local preference. Now what that means is that you prefer a path through a customer over a path through a peer, over a path through a provider. Um, we are also doing robustness tests to this assumption, so we're trying other local preference models and seeing if the results hold up. But this is what I'm showing for, for the results I'm going to show in this talk. Okay, good. So, um, so given that we have these three different models of partial deployment, if we go back to the situation we saw before, what should Greenhost do? Right, so if we're in the security third model, what's going to happen is that route length for Greenhost will trump security. And so in the case of this attack, this path is actually shorter than the secure route, and the attacker will choose the insecure route. So this is a classic protocol downgrade attack. Right? What's happening is you're exploiting the fact that he has to use the old protocol, and he uses this kind of decision process that allows him to prefer the old protocol over the new one and get him to downgrade. Okay? So all the results that I'm going to show you, and we did a lot of simulations to try to understand how often this happens, and actually it happens a lot. Um, and so this is going to account for most of what I'm showing you. So, yep. uh, so just to understand your simulation, you just yeah. uh, picked an AS at random and said, okay, so this AS is going to prefer route length over security, or uh, uh, based on the probability okay, setting. So the setting we're looking at is, like, assume everybody prefers route length over security. So, so let's assume we're working in the, so I'm going to call that, let's assume we're working in the security third model. Um, and then what we do in our simulations is we pick attackers and destinations and, a, and some set of secure nodes. And we're going to see who routes to the attacker and who routes to the destination. And how are those secure nodes picked? Right. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> um, right. But, but everybody uses the same uh, security policy. Right. So let me tell you a couple of reasons why we did that. One, because it was hard to analyze if they all use different security policies because we now have to analyze different sets of secure nodes and different set of different security policies, so it starts to get too complicated. Another reason is because we can show that BGP won't converge if people use um, different security policies, which meant that our simulations wouldn't converge. So we didn't we didn't actually try to do any experiments with, with multiple security policies. Okay. So you asked me, um, how do you choose the set of secure nodes? Right, so we di didn't want to choose the set of secure nodes because you can imagine that, so there's four, 40,000-ish autonomous systems in the internet, how do you choose the set of secure nodes? What we wanted to do was try to quantify security without actually having to do that, without having to choose a set of secure nodes. So let's look at this, and I'm gonna show you how we did that. So let's look at this graph. We're going to assume that we're in the security third model. So route length trumps security. So let's look at Greenhost. Greenhost here is a very particular property. Um, Greenhost, what we call Greenhost is doomed. So <laughs> why is he doomed? So in the security third model, the attacker <coughs> offers him a route that's two hops long, whereas his legitimate route is three hops long, or four, three, right? So the, the attacker's route is shorter than the legitimate route. And that's if everybody in this network is secure. The attacker's route will still be shorter than the legitimate route. If I make everybody be insecure, the same thing will be true. The attacker's route will still be shorter. If I secure some subset of nodes here, this will still be true, right? It doesn't matter who I secure in this network, this node, Greenhost, will always be attacked. It will always be doomed, okay? So in the security third model, you can identify, and similarly the security second model, you can identify nodes that are doomed. And this allows us to determine the maximum benefit you can get from BGPsec. Because even if we have a full deployment of BGPsec, the doomed nodes will remain doomed. They will still go to the, they will still route to the attacker and be attacked. Well, here's one possibility is you said that, uh like customers might be preferred over over peers or people you don't have a business relationship. Mm -hmm. Would that possibly alter this behavior? For example, bring us had a customer that was secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, in the security first model, this this prefer customer peer will determine a lot of who's doing and who's not doing. Yeah, that's very that's very important for this model. Um, I just want to call your attention to one other thing. You can classify these nodes here and layer an SCNet as immune. Okay. So let's look at these nodes. It doesn't matter what the attacker is going to do here. SCNet is always closer to legitimate destination, right? Nobody is secure, he's still closer. Everybody is secure, he's still closer, right? It doesn't matter who you secure in this network. SCNet and similarly NLayer will both always route to the legitimate destination. They have no need for BGPsec in the security third model. So in this graph, the only person who actually benefits from BGPsec, who will change its routing decision based on what's secure and what's insecure, is this node here, NTT, right? Because what it's learning here is a two hop or three hop path to the destination that's legitimate and then a same length path to the destination that's bogus. 
And so if that path happens to be secure, maybe he'll choose it. But if it's not secure, maybe he prefers the other path for some other reason, maybe meds or some other reason. So the takeaway from this is that we can actually classify nodes into three groups, doomed, immune, and what we call this protectable. Only the protectable nodes actually benefit. I understand is, is why BGP site makes a difference versus the, the RPI. Can you explain that again? Sure. So what RPI is doing is imposing that the attacker can only do this attack. If there was no RPI, what he would do is he would just claim to own the prefix itself. And in particular, you can even claim to own a subprefix. And if he owned a subprefix, everybody in the network would write. So, so what's happening is by imposing this, this kept the whole thing by imposing RPI. What's happening is that the attacker's success is determined by his, his position in the topology of the network. In the absence of RPKI, what determines his success is just an absent alarm of prefix. It could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. So you're really weakening the attacker by forcing him to attack, um, to announce a path that is actually for the same prefix, and you have to make sure you force him to actually attract the people that are close to him. Right, I understand that, but what was the, could you clarify again what, what, what the effect of BGPSEC is again? Right, so BGPSEC would prevent. Um, so in this particular uh, picture, it's not preventing him from doing any attacks. He's just attacking whatever he would attack as if there was no BGP sec. He's just downgrading to claim BGP and attacking the BGP. So there's nothing preventing his attack. What is what is working, it's not changing the attacker's attack. What it's changing is the decisions of the other nodes. So the nodes that are actually secure, let's look at MTT here. If he was a secure node using, and uh, he learned the secure route, he might, in, in the security third model, these are equal length paths but this one will be secure, and this one will be insecure. And so that means he should choose this one in the security third model. And so what security is, what BGPSEC is doing, it's changing the decisions of other nodes, but it's not changing the attacker's actions. I guess the thing I don't under, understand is, is that, well, I guess, I guess I can just look it up, but, but uh, if I understand it correctly, if you deploy RPK, yeah, that, that's really enough to give you, to enough, oh, wait, is BGPSEC saying that basically every hop in the route has to be signed by the, yeah. by the okay, I understand. Yes. That, yeah, okay. Yeah. So just to flash the yeah, yeah, again, so, uh, yeah. this is what it looks like. Every every hop is going to be signed by everyone. Yeah, so, so basically the rest of the route is encapsulated by the guy who's upstream or something. Exactly. So. Right, so, so, right, so just to summarize this, right, what's happening here is that the attacker's success will depend on his position in the network, and that's being forced by RPKI because they can no longer do some prefix hijacks that will attract the entire traffic the entire network just because the prefix is not. So, we did some evaluation of this in each one of the three security models. Okay. Um, so what I'm showing here, this line, this is a line, um, so I should tell you what the y-axis is first. So what, what did we measure here? So what we did was we ran a whole bunch of simulations where we picked attackers and destinations in the graph, so two nodes in the graph. We have the graph of the autonomous systems. We get this from the UCLA research. Um, UCLA's research. We pick an attacker and destination. We run a simulation to see where traffic will flow, and we count how many destination, how many nodes go to the legitimate destination, and how many nodes go to the attacker. Okay. Then we compute the average overall attackers and destinations. So what this line shows you is this is the fraction of nodes that do not go to the attacker just with our Okay. So if there's no BGPSEC, nobody has deployed BGPSEC. Um, a, more than half of the nodes will not route to the attacker, um, even without Ed, BGPSEC at all. Okay. Now what this is showing you is, this is assuming full deployment of BGPSEC. What we, the way we computed this, this is assuming that, um, this is what we did here is we subtracted out the doomed nodes. We figured out which nodes were doomed, and we could subtract them, and this will show us an upper bound on the maximum security you can get with BGPSEC, and in particular a full deployment. Okay, so a partial deployment will happen somewhere between. Okay, so what you can see is in the security third model, the gains that you have over RPKI are about 17%, 36% in the security second model, and then you get up to 100% uh, improvement with the security first model. So are you assuming a single attacker? Yeah, we're always assuming a single attacker. Why is that? Um, on, honestly, because there are too many parameters. So there's a couple of problems with multiple attackers. Um, with BGPSEC, if you have colluding attackers, everything fails because they can just connect themselves, and that might not be there. So I, I've never tried to actually have multiple including attackers in the top of the set. Yeah, I mean, we had to play with uh, routing policies, selection of nodes. Um, so we didn't actually look at multiple attackers. It's clearly coming, though. Multiple attackers at the same time. Yeah. Two, two, sorry. 
Yeah, the, the power would go up significantly, right? Because they'd be closer to more parts of the Yeah. Okay. Um, so this was just to remind, this is just an upper bound that we computed by removing the new nodes. Um, here's just one example. We tried many different deployments. Um, this is one that we picked. This deployment is securing all the tier ones and 100 nodes of highest degree and all their stubs. So for those who understand that good, for those who don't, that's about 50% of the nodes in the graph. So we wanted to understand how close we get to these upper bounds, and you can see that this is how close we get. So in the security um, first model, if we secure about half the nodes in the graph, we get about halfway to where we could have gotten. But in these other models, if we secure half, we have much lower numbers. So the reason why is this happening, and there are a lot of effects that we found here. I'll just briefly mention some of them. One of them is protocol downgrade attacks that I showed you. That's the main effect. Some other things that we see are you're not secure, but someone next to you is secure, and he picked a good route, so you also picked a good route. Right, so you get some sort of benefit from someone being secure for you, and you're gonna pick a good route before because they did. Those are the two major effects. There are other weirder effects. One effect is you are insecure, someone next to you is secure. You used to use their route, but now because they're secure, they're using this super long route through the network, through the secure part of the network. So what's gonna happen to you? You don't wanna use them ever. You're gonna use some other short route that's not through the sky, right? And so that's gonna open you up to attacks. And so what you actually can show is that as you secure more nodes in the network, you can actually get more nodes being attacked, right? Because the paths get longer and people avoid those nodes and then they go close to the attack. So you have to sort of, we, what we did was we looked at all the different reasons that these numbers go up and down, and the biggest effect that we found was protocol downgrade attacks. So what you're seeing is you have, let's say, you know, a quarter of the paths in the network are secure, but people are just not using them. As soon as the attacker attacks, they choose the attacker's route. Yep. So uh, maybe I'm missing something. Uh, could you remind me, like, whether BGP or BGP sec <coughs> signs the entire path all the way up to the destination is, or does it sign only a partial path up to like some intermediate? So that's an important point, yeah. So if we if we look at how this works, it's it's only signing the entire path. This was actually really strongly debated when they were standardizing this. Whether, let's say that this guy's not secure, what do you do, right? What you do is you downgrade back to BGP, and the rest of the path will be signed with insecure BGP. Right, so you only get security if you have a fully signed path by every node on the path. So if you have, uh, BGP sec fully deployed, then the entire AS path all the way to the destination will be signed. Right, okay. right. And if you have it partially deployed, let's say like in this, uh, you know, here. Sorry. Wow. Okay, so when you, um, if you look at uh, this thing, right, you would end up, if we looked at, uh, okay, I can't find it, but if we look at this setting, right, then this path here would be signed, but as soon as it goes to Greenhost, who doesn't speak BGP sec, let's say, in this particular setting, then this would downgrade to plain BGP, and it would be sent to insecure. Yeah. That's fair right? So, you know, everybody, it's signed all the way down recursively, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is, which is nice, because if you know, you can say, oh, well, I trust the guy up here, but I don't trust this guy down there, so you know, it's, maybe it's not good. Yeah. Yep. A sort of primitive question, so. How would Cyberpunk initially care or clean post if he's a tech? Yeah, so the way this worked was that there was this thing called uh, the Netherlands Internet Exchange where a whole bunch of networks just come and connect themselves to the network and then there are route servers there. And um, it, this is instead of like they physically come over and plug their cable into the other guy's router. They go to these exchange points where there are um, route servers that you can just use and you can down the roads from there. So they don't have policy that discriminate these um, No, so people who come into the internet exchange have different kinds of policies. They'll give routes to certain people and accept routes from other people. So these two guys probably have an open policy, which meant they accepted every route on the route server. So it, what it's like, it's like imagine you come to this basically data center. But those um, only happen in the internet, some internet exchanges, not. I'm sorry? Th th that kind of policy only happen in. Certain kind of so if you look at here in DB, for example, there's different kinds of policy. There's open, selective, and I think restrictive. And I think open means you take everything in the internet exchange. I'm not sure. But that's that is how this happened. It happened in the Netherlands internet exchange. So they sort of injected this into the Netherlands internet exchange, and whoever was accepting their routes saw this route. And it turns out that Greenhost didn't have the slash 32 filter on, and they got it back this way. Okay. So I guess. What I, the point of this thing is that 
thing is really just to show you that um, by forcing the attacker to be constrained by the topology, the success of his attack goes down. And then when you combine that with the decision, the routing policies that people use, the gains over our PPI become smaller. So that's really the main, the main result of this paper. And then just a little bit about how we did this. Um, we did this via simulation. Um, we tried lots of different things. We used different graphs. So this graph, for those who understand what I mean, there's a lot of questions about how many edges are there in the internet. So we just threw four times more edges into the graph just to see what it would do. Didn't really change anything. Um, we changed, we tried different destinations, with different attackers, we, and we're currently in the process of writing a journal paper where we're going to try the different local preference models. We haven't seen a lot of changes from the local preference models. Okay. So, um, so to summarize what we showed here, um, what we're finding is by forcing the attacker to actually announce paths to prefixes that are really being announced, and constraining him by the topology, the gains we're getting here are actually a lot uh, more than we would have expected. We don't really need to go all the way here, even though you can exploit the RPI with a fairly obvious attack. The success of the attack is really constrained by the topology, and the topology is such that paths are short enough that the success of that attack is actually not that good. Right? The legitimate paths are pretty short, so the attacker announcing a short path doesn't mean that he's going to win all that often. Um, and so, um, it sort of raises a question when we were using, if we're going to use the GPSEC, um, how are we going to use it in the routing policies? And so if we're not using it in, as a security first routing policy, which does actually give us pretty good performance from the GPSEC, you know, wh what do we get from that protocol? So anyway, um, what we started doing was we started looking at RPPI and what it takes to actually get this thing deployed. And so what I want to talk about briefly is um, how, what are the hurdles and challenges to moving to um, using the RPPI? So this is a Hoggins paper in which I'm going to only raise questions and not offer solutions. So don't expect any solutions. <laughs> um, we're actually working on some solutions. So let's go back to our picture. This is the first picture we saw before. Um, so here we have a row that exists in the RPKI. And this is to your question from before. Here we have a row that exists in the RPKI. Here we have a routing announcement that we want to be bogus. This routing announcement should be bogus so that everything is good and we prevent things like this. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we should have a, a certificate in the RPPI that is this certificate and it should be invalid? Of course not, right? There's not going to be any certificate here, right? There will not be nothing in the RPPI that connects this to this, right? So what does that mean? It means that what you expect from the existence of certificates is not actually the way you can build the system, okay? So if you think about certificates, normally what we do when we have a certificate is if the certificate is valid, whatever it's validating is valid. If the certificate is invalid, like the signature is bad or something's wrong with it, then the thing that we're validating is invalid. And if the certificate's not there, then we have no information. Okay. That's not the case in the RPPI for exactly what I showed you before. So you can have a certificate that's missing or not there, and what that's going to do to the BGP route is make it RPPI invalid. And that's exactly the example I showed you before. Similarly, if you have a certificate that's invalid, it might just make the um, BGP route unknown. I'm not telling you why that is, but the same thing can happen there as well. So this is actually um, one of the big challenges of this system that you were bringing up. If there's a certificate that's not there, what are you supposed to do? Does that mean that the route is invalid and it's a hijack? Or does that mean that nobody got around to actually deploying this certificate yet because we're in the partial deployment process? Okay. So this is, um, and then there's also a problem with misconfigurations. What if someone puts in the wrong certificate and causes things to be valid by mistake? Like what happens if someone makes a typo and puts the wrong AS over here that causes something below it to actually become valid? Okay, so Actually getting the right set, the right validity set for the system is quite difficult. And um, so that's the influ influence that RPI has on the actual route validity. The next piece of influence that the RPI has is actually the routing decision. So when we went back to our simplified slide over here, right, what we showed was that our, this guy is dropping RPI invalid routes, and so he's not going to use this route, and so he's going to route this way, which is simple, right? And that's what we need in order to prevent prefix IDX. But what happens if the reason that something's invalid is because the certificate was missing or it was wrong or someone typed it badly or something bad happened to the RPPI, someone compromised the RPPI. And so what that means is that the, actually the route will go offline, right? If you're not going to select an RPPI invalid route, if something weird happens to cause the route to become invalid, you're not going to use the route. And so it can actually harm connectivity. So this is actually one of the biggest deployment challenges here is how do we balance between a routing uh, protections against routing hijacks and protections against RPPI problems? 
I'm not giving you enough details to understand this, but there have been other policies proposed, so different routing policies proposed. The ones that were proposed will stop the problem of something going wrong in the RPKI and taking prefixes offline, but what it doesn't prevent is sub-prefix hijacks, which I've, what I've been saying the whole time is that these are the worst attacks that you can do, right? So you have this challenge of how do you deal with the fact that if things become invalid, what are you supposed to do with them? What does it actually mean? And this is particularly a challenge um, when we're deploying the system. So this is one of the things we're trying to, to deal with. The second thing I want to show is um, how can you cause something to become invalid deliberately? Okay, so this is something that we did when we were reading the specs and we showed this to the, the designers and they weren't expecting that this could happen. So here's something that everybody knew would happen. This is a certificate hierarchy. In any certificate hierarchy or public key infrastructure, you have certificate revocation lists. They're there because the keys can get compromised and you need some way to update the certificates, right? So you need to be able to say this certificate is compromised, the key is bad, for your certificate. So the existence of certificate uh, lists, uh, sorry, certificate revocation lists means that you now have a technical means to actually seize IP prefixes. This is something we've never had before in the internet. So today, when you get an IP prefix, you go to this guy, Aaron, at least in this area, you, you go to Aaron and you say, I want a prefix, and they give it to you, and they put a, data, they put a database entry in who is, saying this is your prefix, and that's the end. There is no, there's nothing that feeds directly into routers that will influence how routers make their decisions based on the allocation of this prefix. The presence of the system changes that, right? So one thing that now could happen is um, if Sprint, for some reason, wanted to prevent this AS from using this prefix, it could just revoke this certificate. So it would um, revoke the certificate, and the impact of that would be that all these things would be revoked. Okay, so this is a really blunt way to do a revocation. Certainly, if, if, if this guy wanted to target this certificate, it could just revoke it. But, but what everybody would know that Sprint is the fault there. That's right, yeah. yeah and also, they, I mean, they have, these guys all have business relationships, right? I mean, uh, okay, so both of you are involved. Okay, so <laughs> this is actually an interesting aspect of the system. So one thing that they did, so certainly if they were doing the certificate revocation test, <coughs> yes. However, how did they build the system? So the system is built through repositories. Um, repositories are controlled by the issuer. So this certificate was issued by this guy, which means it sits in his repository. Okay, so this is what Sprint's repository is doing. Now what was done to make key rollover more efficient is that um, the way you do key rollover is overriding the old certificate. Okay, so that's the first observation. So you don't actually have to put on the certificate revocation list, which if you did that, that would be a non-repeatable way to prove that you did something. But here you can actually override things and you don't have to even put on the certificate revocation list. So that's one thing that's uh, sort of designed for rollover. Really. <laughs> yeah, that's a design decision that they made to make rollover. Well, why would that prevent them from the uh, Oh, you're saying because now people would look up the wrong key. Um, so, you can verify. So, uh, so now I'm going to show you. I want to show you. And then what did you say? You said that they all have business relationships. Okay, so that's not necessarily true in all parts of the IP address space. I'm going to show you that. Oh. <laughs> so, um, okay. right, so let's that, that seems to be an implicit assumption in the design, and if that's not the right, case. Yeah. Right, so it is true in, all, in many parts, but not all parts. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so here's what I, I'm going to... Chaos is going to ensue if you don't have that, right? I mean, probably, well, the chaos is ensuing precisely with that. So... <laughs> Which is to say that if I'm at and I can just allocate pieces of sprints after this week, that's madness, right? Right, so there's nothing like at and allocating, but let me show you. Yeah. Let me show you what we... Okay, so just back to your question. He wants... Let's suppose he wants to target this, okay? So there's two things. One, the repositories are... Uh, managed by the issuer of the certificates. That's the first thing. The second thing is that these are certificates for sets, not for names or individual points. So since I can overwrite certificates and they're for sets, here's what he's going to do. He's going to overwrite this certificate with the same certificate, right, except that he's going to remove one address here. That address is inside here, which means this guy can't be valid anymore. Okay, so what's happening here, and this is what we find when Kyle was, um, was last summer working with me. So this particular certificate can go, can be taken down very, in a very targeted way with this overwriting uh, thing. And so we did a study of you know, how, how this is possible. And when we showed this to the designers, they actually didn't realize that this was going to be a possibility. Okay, so these are some challenges of like, how do you actually deal with the fact that there can be uh, revocations, overwriting, and very targeted manipulations of this hierarchy. So to the other question, um, what's going on with this hierarchy? So this is just one view of what's going on with this hierarchy. So we tried to model the hierarchy. The reason we modeled it is because the deployment is too small to see what it would look like in the future. So we built a model using PGP uh, information and um, 
stuff from the routing information registries and AS to country mapping. So this is a sorry. So this is a um, a map of the IPv4 address space. What you're doing, imagine the IPv4 address space is a line and you fold it up into a Hilbert curve. The result is that this thing is a slash 8, half of this is a slash 9, one quarter is a slash 10, and so on. Okay, so this is the entire address space. And what I'm showing here is the different the number of countries that are sitting under a, a certificate for each direct allocation. So the, the root of this RPKI is the routing information registries, and then one level below them. These are the number of countries that these things cover. So you can see most of this is blue, which means only one country is affected by a particular certificate, but you can see that some of this is green. Um, in particular, here are some interesting examples. Sprint is actually an interesting example. These particular addresses are interesting because these were allocated a long time ago, and then pieces of them were given out to different people who just took them into different places. And so if you do a mapping from the autonomous system to the country that it's in, the RIRs have these mappings. And this is really a first order approximation of countries over there, and there might be more countries. Um, you can see that these certificates cover um, things in multiple countries. So there are some interesting questions on how you um, how you manage this. And then to your question, can you detect if something goes wrong? And that's actually what we're working on, and a bunch of people are working on right now. So the need for monitoring in this kind of infrastructure to prevent this behavior is obviously very important. And people have done work on this for SSL certificates, but only starting now for so I'm going to finish now. Uh, okay. So um, one thing that we're pretty excited about at BU is we're trying to understand how you can build this system in a, in a way that we're retroactively securing a system in a way that can feed into router space. And you want to do this in a stable way. You have to deal with the fact that in missing objects, invalid objects, can cause people to drop routes. So you better be very careful about what you do with invalid objects. And similarly, there could be um, sort of misconfigurations, faults, abusive behavior, and so on that can cause routes to become invalid and potentially be unreachable. So some of the things we're looking at is trying to understand what to do about routing policies in the transition to the deployment of this thing. Another thing is looking at some of the techniques that people have developed for certificate transparency in SSL, um, which is a completely different system. The biggest difference is that it's not hierarchical. It's completely flat, where every certificate is allowed to sign any certificate for anyone. In ours, it's in this system, it's very specific, only for the prefixes you own. So there are lots of techniques there, and some of them might be used here, and we're also looking at a variety of other um, issues in the partial deployment as this thing gets gets involved. Okay. So if PGDSEC is where you, where you would like to be, and you say the gain is marginal, but it seems that that argument is based on very marginal gains in the process of getting uh, right? and the problem yeah. is the deployment of the internet yeah. you know, But if, if it represents where you really want to be, yeah. uh, why not they explore different ways to get that? Right? And there are, mm -hmm. there are presumably other ways to... So, other ways being other routing policies or other protocols? Um, so, for example, uh, uh, I'll, I'll suggest things that probably don't work, mm -hmm. um, but it appears to really, you know, it's, it's relying on the, uh, either the human indifference or the, the, the operators, you know, the, the ordering of their place in security. Mm -hmm. um, presumably, if you can create <coughs> trusted islands that consist of multiple ASs, mm -hmm. um, or higher up in the hierarchy, and let's say I, met, I require that anybody that connects to them is going to be you actually be able to create portions of the yeah. network that, that can be more trusted. Now, uh, clearly you need to do this in a way that um, uh, where the short paths that can be compromised are less likely to be less likely to be that right. so you can pick your own together. But it would seem as though there would be a sort of a, a, a social approach to this or a human approach to this to try and persuade the points by, by area. Or of course there's a way of mandate. Do that, but, uh, I it seems as though the implications are severe yeah. enough that uh, you'd say, okay, well, you can't have your address space in the world unless you know, at the end of next year, unless you're actually using uh, each of these No, I actually do think that would work. I mean, when we were talking about how like, we don't want to be perceived as this everything sucks. So when we were talking about solutions, that's one of the things we were thinking about. Is there parts of the network where you know the business relationships and the conflicts are such that you could actually require people to do security first? Mm -hmm. 
we actually haven't done that yet, but I do think that that's a good way forward, actually, and that is one of the things you should be I'm not sure exactly how you would do it, but it would be probably for certain prefixes where the facts have this kind of property, no. then let's all do some certain first, yeah. and that's how far we go. Seems incredibly uninternet like philosophy. And, you know, what you described, you know, say the telephone companies get re emerged as the, the trusted <laughs> parties that yeah, control yeah. everything. And you sit there as dumb telephones and just trust it to be <coughs> everything right. And, and that's on top of the fact that nobody really scaled PKI to the scale. Right? And what's the time out on these certificates? How big can the gravitation was? How do you communicate these securely? And <clears throat> how do you provide security when it's a trade-off between getting the packets through versus waiting to get better certificates somehow or other? And so doesn't this just sound like the wrong approach? So I'm not going to comment on that. I mean, I, I think I, I can say a couple of things. I think these are valid concerns. I think that there are a couple of things that they are working on and they're aware of in the, in the working group of the ICS. One of them is exactly how do you deliver these in a secure way. So there are a lot of issues that are being discussed right now and how do you build this repository structure and communicate the certificates to I mean, it's not users. a new problem, right? Yeah. This, this whole revocation problem has been out there for the last 30 years, unsolved, so. Right. So there are alternate proposals by doing it doing certificate distribution through DNS, <coughs> which, <laughs> which also has its problems because DNS is a query infrastructure and what you really what you really do want here is a wholesale download of things and DNS will have to miss their query. So that's one of the proposals in terms of actually building the infrastructure that hasn't been solved. Is anybody, again, I think that's just the wrong approach, right? It's just completely wrong. <laughs> why, 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 is it, wait, why, why is it wrong again, Clark? Yeah. Like, so the so one of the things like one of the things that is interesting and I agree with is that there is, you know, Sprint here. Like what's Sprint doing here? The reason Sprint is here is because in the nineties they got the cyberspace and they chucked it up and gave it to people and all of a sudden and people walked off of the space and all of a sudden here they are back in the hierarchy and controlling the space again. Which is interesting. My bet is it's never going to be deployed, just like PKI has been around for 30 years and it's basically fraud security. And it's <coughs> what's revocation and why it's used? You know, it's when a new browser gets released every six months, you can three years. Well, it's like, it's like every day with Chrome. Really. So, I mean, what they are saying you should do is you should every day you should download the certificates. And the new view of the. Um, so, it's you're a compromised. Day. Wait for 24 hours and hope nothing bad happens. And then, like, yeah. Power grid goes over the cliff. Well, David, do you have a different report? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do nothing, it's the other approach. No, I think the other approach is you recognize that <coughs> you need to basically be able to do source routing. You have to have enough knowledge at the endpoint because fundamentally, <coughs> if that's discoverable, all that somebody should care about is can I get packets from A to B and figure out whether I'm actually getting the B and you know, secure transport protocol gets you that, so you just need to know the options. This is going in the opposite <coughs> direction where you're going to secure all of this and Sprint's going to hide more and more because of business reasons and so on. <coughs> Or instead of controlling and observing, being able to see what path the packet spec is going to be able to use your choice. I mean, the internet philosophy is end to end, right? If there's a path from A to B, you should be able to use it. And, and this says, well, not a sprint has any say in this. That's, I think, a really good criticism. Like, this seems to violate the internet <coughs> principle of it, so why is that a good idea? Why yeah, why is it good for the internet part? I guess the question is. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.